I often look at our own family pictures, the ones that we put on Facebook. You know, pe people's life doesn't actually look like the feed that you're looking at on Facebook or Instagram, but I often look at the pictures and I'm like, who is that? Oh, that's our family. Because the five minutes before that was a wrestling match, which actually works out really well because my son's love language is actually wrestling. I've got um, four kids. Uh, my wife and I have four kids, uh, eight, six. Today, uh, one of them turns five and three, and three of them are boys, and any time we just need to connect, it's just, it's World War III is what really needs to happen. And so we get up into the, one of the boys' bedrooms, and two of them are relegated to the corners, and they're supposed to tag in, but inevitably our five-year-old elbow drops off the bed, and somebody gets broken. But we're all connecting, and honestly, that's a lot of what life looks like, and I'm proud uh, of that in my boys, because one of my favorite games growing up was this game called King of the Hill. Are you familiar? All right? It really, all it takes, here are the necessities for a solid game of King of the Hill. Anything that is elevated at least one inch higher than everything around it, uh, and some people, uh, particularly small, aggressive ones, who have a general disregard for their own well-being. Uh, and you can have a great game of King of the Hill. For those of you unfamiliar, it's really just, you want to be on the very highest point, and everyone else is trying to knock you off to get and stay at the highest point. And you're King of the Hill when you're at the highest point. And so, uh, we play it in lots of ways. You can play it on a raft in a pool. You can play it uh, in, uh, in, a, in Illinois. We would play in a barn full of hay, and we'd stack it up in pyramids, and bodies would roll, and parts would break, and people, it would be awesome. It was just great. You would know it was over when someone was bleeding or crying. And then only maybe is it over. It just depends, right? This game of King of the Hill, and honestly, our life looks a lot like that as well. The truth is, all of us in our lives, there are things in our lives playing King of the Hill all the time, but the truth is, is that something is the main thing in your life, that every family has a main thing. Every family has a king of the hill, right? There's all these aspects of our lives, work and play and recreation and family and kids and all these other things. Uh, depending on what your family shape is, every family has something that's competing for the top most important thing, the king of the hill. And so we're just gonna begin today by asking you to wrestle with what is the king of the hill in your life. Not what do you wish it was, or what do you tell people that it is, or what does your Facebook feed say that it is, what is actually the main thing in your family? So let me just uh, ask a few questions, this will be fun. You should play together with someone in your family and see if you have even close to the same answer, okay? Here's the first question. What is the most frequent topic of conversation in your family? Maybe that would point you toward what the main thing in your life is. Last night someone like totally started laughing and I was like, well, afterwards I asked her, it's like, we talk about bathroom humor a lot. I'm like, try question two. Here's question two. <laughs> your calendar. Look at your calendar. What gets the most play on your calendar? Now, not just in terms of quantity, but in terms of importance. What are the non-negotiables on your calendar? They're the thing that when people invite you to something else, you most often say, well, I can't because this. The things that don't get moved, maybe that'll point you toward the main thing. If you were to look at your spending patterns, maybe it's the thing that gets the money first, or the things you most want to spend money on, or the things you most often spend money on. Uh, maybe it's where your mind goes when it wanders, right? It's just when you're uh, zoning out, your mind often wanders off, and this is where it ends up. Maybe that's the main thing in your family. Or I would love this one. Uh, we moved three years ago. It was really interesting to watch our house uh, be packed up and moved and all these other things, and I just wonder what the people were thinking about us. Like, if someone came into your house and packed up all your stuff, I bet they would have a pretty good idea what the main things in your family really are just based on the physical things in your home. Well, the truth is, is that everybody has a main thing, and none of those things that I suggested are bad. I just don't think any of them are worthy of being the main thing in our life. They're all good things. They're all aspects of our lives, and like children grappling for the top of a hill, all of those things at different times have different levels of urgency or consequence if they don't get the right amount of attention. Turns out you have to feed your kids for them to survive, so that takes a lot of time. And They grapple for the top, the king. They want to be king of the hill, but none of them are worth it. Every family has a main thing. What's yours? Not what do you say it is. What is it really? We're gonna wrestle with that a little bit today, kind of over the whole course of our time together. But the truth is, everybody has a main thing, and you choose it. No one else chooses it for you, and if they do, it's because you let them. You choose it intentionally, or you don't choose it intentionally. You just respond to what's around you, the stage of life that you're in, the most pressing need, the thing that'll have the most consequence if you don't do it. But everybody has a main thing. 
Now, I've never met a family that was, when they set out to be a family, they were just like, man, I have a dream. What do you dream for your family? Like, man, I hope we are a train wreck and we hate each other. <laughs> no one sets out for that, right? Everybody wants to have a great family. But the truth is, is great families don't happen on accident. Our natural drift is not toward awesome family, right? If we just let things go or we get complacent, what happens is they tend to fall apart. Wrong things become the main things. Great families don't happen on accident. So it would be really wise of us to choose what our main thing is on purpose. Now, I'm about to blow your mind. Are you ready? I'm gonna suggest that God should be the main thing in all our families. You're all like, I did not see that coming. In church, really? <laughs> of course, in fact, even if I had asked you what do you think should be the main thing in your life, many people who would show up here, unless you were like duped into coming here and you're not sure where you are, which by the way, welcome. But if you got here to church, you probably saw that coming. But maybe it's not quite that simple. I mean, the church answer is often right, but it's just not nearly as simple as we normally throw out there. So we're gonna talk through two questions for the most of our time. Two questions about God being the main thing for real. Now, I'm not talking about the gluten-free. I mean, God first sticker on the back of your car. That doesn't actually make God the first thing in your life, right? It's a good reminder, it's a good step, it's a good sentiment, but is it true? We're gonna look at this. Now, the first question is why. Why should God be the main thing in our lives? We all have this inclination, like, oh, we're in church, yeah, it's probably the thing, but why? Now, we're gonna do this from a couple different places in the scripture. The primary place we're gonna land is in Deuteronomy chapter six. So if you have a Bible, grab it, Deuteronomy chapter six. If you have your device, you can look it up or you can check it out on the screens. Before we read, you need to know what this book's about. Uh, Deuteronomy is written by a dude named Moses just before the people of Israel go into the, to the promised land. Now, to catch you up in case you're not familiar with the history, here's how it played out. God said, Abraham, I'm gonna make you a family. He turns them into 70, but they get super hungry. So they go to Egypt under Joseph, who was a brother sold into slavery. In Egypt, this family of 70 over the course of the next 400 years becomes a people of two million who are slaves under Pharaoh, and they whine about it, and God says, okay. So God goes, gets this reject son of Pharaoh, Moses, in the desert, who's 80 years old, through a burning bush, and says, you, you go back to Egypt and tell the most powerful person on the planet to let his workforce go. So he goes, and he says, Pharaoh, let God's people go, and Pharaoh says, no. So God sends 10 plagues, and Pharaoh says, get out of here. So they leave, they get backed up against the river, God says, the Red Sea, and God says, Bloop splits it, they walk through, mountain, 10 commandments, 40 years because they were whiners in the desert, and then all of a sudden we're at the river. Everybody caught up? Are we good? <laughs> First five books of the Bible, boom, well, most of them. <laughs> but here's the thing, Moses was kind of, he, he was disrespectful to God, he did not obey, and there was a consequence, there's always a consequence, and he didn't get to go into the promised land. And so Deuteronomy is, all the last words of Moses to these people before they crossed the river under a dude named Joshua to conquer the land God had promised. And so in Deuteronomy chapter six is one example of some of these words that he said, and there are three, at least three reasons God should be the main thing that apply just as much to us as they did to these people. The first one we pick up in Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 21. He says, when your children ask, in verse 21, then you must tell them, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. But the Lord God brought us out of Egypt with his strong hand. The Lord did miraculous signs and wonders before our eyes, dealing terrifying blows against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his people. He brought us out of Egypt so he could give us this land he had sworn to give our ancestors. The first reason God deserves to be king of the hill is because of what he's done. What he has done. Moses constantly, if you were to read the book of Deuteronomy, it's a great book, it's all this recap, but he's constantly pointing back to what God had done. And the truth is the same for us. There's many people in this room who have figured out that Jesus is the deal. We have recognized in our own lives, we've gotten to know ourselves well enough that we are messed up. And if there is a perfect God, then we don't deserve to have his attention. We have done nothing to earn his love or attention, but he gave it to us anyway by showing up on our planet as Jesus and showing us what life with him could look like. And more than that, 
dying for everything we have ever done to offend God so that nothing could separate us from God. And then on top of that, he sets up camp in our lives by the Holy Spirit and makes us more and more alive the more that we follow his way. And he promises that not only in this life, our life will be filled up, and many of us are experiencing that, that God is bringing us life all the time, but that it will last forever, that we get to be with him for all of eternity that God has rescued us in his son, Jesus. And the truth is, there is no one or no thing ever that will do more for us than God has already done for us. God deserves to be the king of the hill. God should be the king of the hill in our lives. Number two, it's for our benefit. Moses says it this way in Deuteronomy chapter six, verses one through three. So these are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You're like, wow, rules for our benefit, sweet. So here's what Moses is talking about. When Moses uh, brought the people of Israel out, they had not interacted with the creator God. They had interacted with all these idols in the, in the land of Egypt, but they didn't know how to interact with God. And so God gave them the Ten Commandments and a whole bunch of other laws. And the idea behind them was, here's how you interact. Not to become my people, I've already rescued you. You are my people. But here's how we interact as a people. He gave them laws dealing with their own physical health. He gave them laws dealing with their society and how to interact with one another. He gave them personal laws on how to care for themselves and spiritual laws on how to interact with God. The entire picture, and that's what Moses is referring to, that God, like the amazing father that we talked about him being last week, provided everything for his children to be in great relationship with him. He says, all that stuff. Verse one again, you must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you. And you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God, your ancestors promised you. It's for our benefit for God to be the king of the hill. In case you missed it, here's uh, that passage in just a few words. God says, here's the deal. If you obey, you'll enjoy long life, because that's what God's laws were about, pointing them toward the fullest life and the most honor for God. And it will go well with you, and you will multiply. Any grandparents in the room? One of the grand, what's the grandparents' favorite thing to talk about? Grandkids, right? And one of the first things out of the gate is how many, right? God promises all of us want a great life to enjoy and walk with God. And we want things to go well with us. And just like grandparents illustrate, we want to have a legacy. We want to multiply. We want to be a part of that. And God says all of that. Just obey what I've said. Just do what I ask you to do. Now, we've figured this out, most of us in the room. Many of us are parents. Uh, some of us in here are kids. Pretty sure I just covered everybody, right? Boundaries are for our benefit. That's exactly what God set up. Isn't this why we discipline our kids? We discipline them for their benefit. They don't like it. They don't believe you when you say that, but we do it for their benefit. It's like my son, Miles, right now, my son Zeke is the youngest and we're potty training him, but when we were potty training, Miles was like, dude, this is for your benefit. I know you hate it. So in the midst of this, my wife was walking down the hall, and especially parents of young children, you get this, your mind is like 47 places all the time and you're lacking sleep. And so she was walking down the hall, and you know how you acquire information, but sometimes it takes a few minutes to put it together? She's walking down the hall, she peeks in the bedroom, and there's Miles, like, huh, why doesn't Miles have pants on? And what was that splashing sound on the carpet? <laughs> sure enough, Miles was uh, taking care of business over here in the corner. So she comes back after doing the math and putting it together, what was happening, and says, Miles, what are you doing? And he turns around and is like, what? That's where I always go. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> so we had some discipline, some rules had to be put in place. Good job not going in your diaper, bud. Let's take a next step so that in second grade you're not the smelly kid and we can eventually sell this house. <laughs> right, it's all the way from the hot stove to teaching our kids not to call names to making them do their homework even when they don't want to and eat their vegetables and pretending to eat ours so they'll eat theirs. Everything, it's for their benefit. God 
created the family and he lines this out and he is the main thing in our lives because that is for our benefit. Our families thrive when he is the main thing. But so often we stop there and we forget and we start to think that it's about us. But number three, it's really for God's glory. It's for his glory that he's on top. Not only has he done more for us than ever, not only is it for our benefit, but it's because of who he is. We start to think that God is about us. And if there's ever a time where teaching in here leads you to believe that, we have messed up. God is not about us. God is for us, but he is not about us. God is about God, which sounds super arrogant because we're used to normal people who are totally jacked up, and when they're all about themselves, we call them prideful and arrogant, right? But for a God who actually is perfect, what else should he be about? In fact, would you want to serve a God that's about you? I don't think so. God is about God. What he is about is his glory and his fame and his renown because he is perfect. He is the way things should be. He is the creator. He's the one who spoke and nothing became something. He should be about him and he's about the whole world knowing him and how awesome he is because it is for their benefit. They will enjoy him but he'll receive glory. In fact, godly families is a primary way that he remakes the world. Sin jacked up the world and he is remaking it and the family is one of the primary ways that he does that. Our families thrive. It, it definitely involves us. It's definitely for our good, but it's not about us. God deserves to be the king of the hill because of what he's done and it is for our benefit and it is for his glory and if you need more than that, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Why should God be the king of the hill? Because. Okay, so how? How does God stay the king of the hill? Because I don't know about your life, but my life, it really is like a game of king of the hill where people are constantly grappling and things and categories are trying to get to the top and I want God to be the king of the hill. I want him to be the main thing. I know it's for my good, but on Tuesday afternoon, that's usually pretty tough. How does God become the main thing? Now, I'm gonna try to give you six words here that paint a big picture of what this could look like. Okay, we're gonna grab four right out of Deuteronomy, chapter six, verses four through nine. Check this out. It says, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Sound familiar? In fact, that, uh, the first part at least, is the Shema. The, the, the Israelites would repeat morning and night, and they would teach their children to re remember and say morning and night. Verse six, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going, going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Four quick words, the first one is repeat. He says repeat these things. This word repeat in the Hebrew language means to sharpen. And imagine sharpening a blade, what you do is you drag it back and forth over something else that takes just a little bit off each time until the blade becomes sharper and sharper and sharper. The same thing happens in our families as we shape our families. He's saying this law, all these things that God has done, those are the things that sharpen us. Those are the things that get repeated over and over and over and over until we are sharpened to know what should be at the core and the main thing in our lives. In fact, if I gave you 20 seconds, I bet you could turn to the person next to you, it wouldn't even take that long, and tell them two or three phrases that your parents said over and over and over and over, right? In fact, they're probably the things you swore you would never say and you do almost every day, right? Repeat, he says. You want God to be the main thing? Repeat, repeat, repeat what he has said. Number two, he says, talk. Now this word talk in Hebrew is like this huge word that when you unpack it, it can mean lots and lots of things. So he says, that here are all the ways we could translate this word besides just talk. You could translate it as speak, declare, converse, command, promise, warn, threaten, sing. We just described your house, right? Like all the different ways we talk to each other in the house. I'm super proud of my son, Miles. The first time he saw Frozen and they broke into song to carry this story forward, he's like, why are they singing? <laughs> like, yes! Two of my other kids, they like live in a musical. They walk around singing random sentences. 
right? But the things that we hear in song, they stick, and we make promises, and we warn, and we threaten, and we do all these things. And he says, if you want God to be the main thing, God needs to be the content of much of your talking. It's why I asked you earlier, what's the primary topic of conversation? God says, talk about this. What kinds of talk? We already said, all kinds of talk. Where do we do this? He says, well, when you're at home and when you're not at home. Pretty much everywhere. That's where we talk about these things. When do we talk about it? Well, when you sit and when you rise. When you're going to bed and when you get up. That's pretty much all the time. Repeat and talk, he says. You're going to talk about something, right? In your family, you're going to talk about something. And I bet if we listen long enough, we would know what the main thing is in each of our homes. Number three, he says, write. Now, i got to unpack this one a little bit more uh, because he actually says, wear them on your wrists and your forehead and write them on your doorposts. And really, all three of these things point to the same thing. Uh, in the Hebrew culture, eventually, it would become common practice that they would lash these small boxes to their wrist and to their forehead. And often inside of those were uh, scriptures that they wanted to live out and remember and it was just a way that they could do this physically because they knew that we were whole beings and our physicality connects to our spirituality. And so that was a practice that they had. In the Egyptian culture, it was commonplace to write things around the door frame of the house. Remember, they just got out of slavery in Egypt because the door is not only the entrance to the house, but it represents access and it represents the whole house itself. And so they would write things that would protect and preserve them in different situations. In fact, there's a little picture of that in the Moses story, right? When, the, when the, uh, uh, they put blood around their door for the Passover, right? That's the picture that we see. Basically, all of these things point to there should be physical reminders in our lives that point toward God. That we are not just spiritual and that God not, is not just God of our spiritual, he's God of everything. That's why I asked you earlier, if I walked through your house, would I see anything that is a constant reminder? It's the cool thing about the GF thing on the back of the car, if it's, for, it's, if it's what it's for, is to remind us that we want God to be first. There should be physical reminders. Number four, he says remember. It, it wasn't in the passage that I read you. It's a little bit farther down. I want to read all of it. But they were gonna go in, Joshua was gonna take these Israelites into this new land, and there was gonna be vineyards already planted for them that they were gonna harvest, and crops they were gonna harvest, and houses they didn't build that they would live in because they were gonna conquer. And God says, when, Moses says, when you get there, it's gonna be a little easy, and isn't it true that when things are easy, we get really forgetful? But he says this in verse 11, when you have eaten your fill in this land, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Now, most of us who've encountered God much in our lives, we want God to be the main thing. It's not that we are ever like, boom, God, off the top of the hill. It's everything else just makes its way in, and we get forgetful, and we get, er, er, and God says, you know what? Remember. In fact, all of those things, repeat, talk, write, all of those things are about remembering what we really want, keeping that intentionally at the forefront of our mind. Now let's quickly pick up two more words real quick in in Ephesians chapter six. This is the New Testament after Jesus. Paul, a follower of Jesus, an apostle, planted a bunch of churches. He writes to us in the the book of Ephesians to a church in Ephesus about what family could look like. One verse, it says this. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up. And I, I won't spend too much time here, but bring them up literally means from birth forever, right? And some of your grandparents are like, preach, right? You got a role all the way through, there's a role, and bring them up means as they grow, okay? But he says here are two words, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now this word discipline is, uh, is not what we think of of punishment, it, it kind of, it's not really. It really means to cultivate the mind, it's talking about education or the way that we learn things as a family. It also includes morals, how we believe about the world and how we behave ethically. It also includes the training and care of our physical body. It's a whole person word is what I'm saying. That as families, we are responsible for the whole person. We don't delegate to others. We are responsible for the whole person. A quick image is when I used to coach football. It's a faint image of a family, but it is a bit of an image. I would coach freshman football, which I love because they would come to practice before they would ever get into high school. Two weeks before, they would show up, and we'd kind of scare them right out of the gate with a bunch of rules, like if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. 110% all the time. Uh, team's more important than the individual. All these different things that we would do. 
and we would give them equipment and we would entrust them with the care of that. We'd put their name right on their helmet because who they were mattered to us. Uh, we would take them out to practice. We'd make sure that their bodies were warmed up before we did anything super physical. There were three days before they got full pads because they needed to be kind of more in shape before they started ramming into one, each, one another recklessly like bobbleheads. It, it, all these different things. Then when school started, we required three days of study hall and if they had a single D, they missed at least a half to teach them that you're not just a football player, you're a student. And we didn't just on the, t on the field show them how to be football players, we taught them how to be young men, to be respectful to coaches, the way that they speak to them, the way they speak, and treat the uh, speak to and treat the referees, the way they treat one another. Their attitude was also important. It affected everything about them, everything that we were allowed to affect about them, we did. That's a picture of this word, discipline. The second word is instruction. Bring them up in the discipline of the Lord, but also in the instruction of the Lord. Instruction literally means to correct by word of mouth. And all the kids in the room said, my parents got that down. <laughs> right? It means that we use our words to encourage, to coach, to correct all these different things. In fact, just to bring it full circle, in case we missed it from Deuteronomy, remember Moses was talking all about the things God had said. Paul uses this exact same word of instruction in 2 Timothy 3.16 where he says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. They're saying the same thing. Are you seeing the fully developed picture? In order for God to be the main thing, we need to repeat, we need to talk, we need to write, we need to remember, we need to discipline, and we need to instruct in our families. Are you also catching that this can't be delegated? Let me just jump on a, on a soapbox for just a second as a youth pastor. In so many ways, we get professionals to do things for our families, and that's not wrong in some ways. We need trained people to do great things. But often people think that they can drop their students off in our children's ministry, which is awesome, or our youth ministry with some great people and some phenomenal volunteer leaders, and think that somehow that's gonna make God the main thing in their lives. But none of those people are there when your children rise and when they go to sleep. None of them are in their homes and out of their homes. This is a pervasive, all the time thing. The main thing in your house will be determined by your family. It will not be determined by some delegated professional. Now again, I think that what we do, I'm investing my life in it, I think it's a big deal. I think you need support and resources and people who've been there and things that can echo, because sometimes teenagers, I don't know if you've heard this, but they have a hard time listening to their parents, and sometimes it's good to hear it from somebody else. It's important, but it could never replace. And in fact, uh, in case you missed this, you could do these six things about anything you want. If you want something else to be the main thing in your life, you could use these same six things. In fact, let's just do a quick hypothetical. Let's suppose it's spring, almost summer. Let's just suppose you wanted baseball to be the king of the hill in your family's life, okay? King of the hill, what would you do? You'd repeat, right? Constantly you'd hear about baseball and sharpening and repeating and sharpening. It'd be season after season after season. It'd be conversation after conversation after conversation. You would repeat. You would talk about it all the time. You would speak, you would declare, you would converse, you would command, you would promise, you would warn, you would threaten, particularly the umpires. You would sing, take me out. You would do all of these things. And you would write. Remember, writing was about physical presence. All around your house would be hundreds of dollars in gloves and bats and balls and cages and all kinds of things. And you'd remember, you'd tell stories, you tell about the great games or the great plays or remember when or that time, and you would discipline. You wouldn't miss practice. You wouldn't miss games. You'd develop the whole person. You might even change your diet for the season. You might even change your family's diet on behalf of the one that's playing. And you would instruct. You'd correct by word of mouth, right? These things will work for any, whatever you want to be the king of the hill, there it is, right? You could do this about anything. But God deserves it, and it's in our best interest. But keeping God the main thing requires us to be diligent, intentional, authentic, and grateful. You can't delegate this. You can do it on accident, but it will be done with something. Something will be the main thing in your family. The question is, are you gonna choose it? Now, before we finish up, I just wanna address some people. It feels like probably that we've been talking a lot about parents and children, which I'm pretty sure, once again, covers everybody in the room. 
But for those of you who that's not your immediate family structure, this applies to everyone. For those of you who are single in the room, think about this. If you want to enter a marriage or a relationship with people at some point, you can't have somebody with a different main thing. If Jesus is gonna be your main thing, a relationship with someone who Jesus isn't the main thing isn't gonna work out well. You're gonna do this all the time. Something is you're gonna be competing against each other for the main thing. It's why Paul said don't be unequally yoked. If you're young and married and you don't have kids yet, you don't just flip this light switch on when you have kids. You need to develop now that God's gonna be the main thing of your relationship and of your house and of the investment of your time and your money and all these things. Because when you have kids, you don't just flip the switch on and all of a sudden you're godly people. Because you're gonna be tired, people. You don't even know how tired you're gonna be. <laughs> it, it doesn't begin later, it begins now. Those of you who are married and you've come to know Jesus but your spouse doesn't, or you're co-parenting with someone who doesn't, I know there are so many things that are out of your control, but you get to choose for you. There are blended families in the scriptures that we look at, and if you're married to a non-believer, 1 Peter chapter three says a lot about that. For the blended families, the steps and halves and all the things, when you describe your family, it gets complicated. You are where you are, and that's awesome, and God is so faithful to meet us where we're at. It's why we're doing the seminar next weekend. It's why Mark McKinney's gonna stand up here next week and talk about what if my family doesn't look like the traditional family, whatever that means. He's got a, uh, they've done adoption, a whole bunch of other things. We're gonna look at what does God have to say about that? This applies to everyone. But you gotta choose. Something will be the main thing. In fact, Joshua, the guy who followed Moses, after they had conquered a bunch of the land, it was the end of Joshua's life. At the end of the book of Joshua, it's kind of the same story. He's given some parting words to the people of Israel. He says this in chapter 24, verse 14. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Sound familiar? Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshiped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. You have to choose. And let me just jump up on something else here real quick. Every parent has this opportunity, every child has this opportunity to redefine the main thing in your family. Everyone has that influence with cousins, uncles, parents, to whatever degree possible. But I just wanna point out who has the most influence right now. It turns out that statistically, if a mom decides to follow Jesus in a family, there's about a one in four chance that the whole family will follow Jesus. Don't get me wrong, any people who know Jesus in a family, anyone living for Jesus in a family is a win. But let me just point at you dads for just a second. Do you know what that statistic goes to if dad decides to follow Jesus and sets a pace? 90 plus percent. Dads, you gotta draw a line in the sand. If kids are gone, if they're still here, if they're not here yet, wherever, you have to draw a line in the sand. Choose today who you will serve and set the pace. Don't let the most aggressive thing in your life get to the top of the hill. I know it's hard, I get the focus, I screw it up all the time, but I'm telling you, you have to set the pace. No matter where you are, no matter your family shape, you have to choose. You'll be better off if you choose. The people of Israel said, okay, we don't want it to be our gods of the past. We don't want to carry on the brokenness of generations in our family. And we don't want to just settle for everybody that's around us like we talked about last week. We want God to be the model of our family. And so they say, boom, let's follow God. And Joshua says, all right. In verse 23, he says, all right then. Joshua said, destroy the idols among you and turn your hearts toward the Lord, the God of Israel. He says, turn your hearts. And heart was not just emotions, heart was the seat of decision, a de the, the, the seat of the will, it was a choice. Turn your hearts, and so here are some challenges. Get rid of your old main things in your life. Get rid of the old main things. Do everything you can to put them in their proper place and invest in your family's relationship with God. God will not become the main thing in your family on accident, invest in this. That's why he said turn your hearts. So here are some challenges. Number one, be grateful. As a family, make time this week to tell the stories of God's work in your life. Parents especially tell your children the ones that they don't know because they weren't born yet. 
Point out God's victories in their lives right now in the places that you want him to win. The more you talk and repeat and write, you're gonna have the opportunity to keep God in the main thing, but celebrate what he's done, be grateful. Number two, take an inventory. Get real honest. Peel the sticker off the back of the car if that helps you be more honest, but be honest about what the main thing is. Walk through your house. Do an honest assessment. If someone who didn't know you walked into your house and just looked at your things and they peeked in your closet or in your garage, I know it's terrifying, what would they say is the main thing in your life? Look at your calendar. What gets there first? What doesn't get to move? What doesn't get trumped on your calendar? I'll get back to that in a second. Number three, look at your spending patterns. What do they say? Last soapbox, I, I promise. As a youth pastor, here's something I hear, and it's so revealing. We start talking about camps like we've been talking about, or any other event, really. And parents say, you know what? He says, not, he says can't make it small groups, got practice. Or you know what, he just can't make it to camp uh, because that's the weekend of the tournament. That's the big one. There's always a big one, by the way. That's the big one. Or, and you know what, we honestly, we can't afford to even pay for half of camp because a whole bunch of our church gave a bunch of money for scholarships for people who need it. But we, there's no way we could possibly afford camp because we've already paid for three sports camps. Your child knows what the main thing is. And it's not God. Sports aren't bad, I'm a fan. You hear me talk about it all the time. They're a great thing, they're just not the king. I'm just saying, I'm not indicting anyone, I'm not judging anyone, I'm simply saying be honest about what the main thing is. Your children will learn it one way or another. Look at your calendar, look at your spending patterns, and look at the content of your conversations. What do you talk about the most? I was a teacher, I'm a youth pastor. The saying that they learn more from what is caught than what is taught is 100% true. Based on these, what's your main thing? Don't beat yourself up, but what is it? Name it, especially if it's not God, name it. And then look at each of those categories and say, how as a family are we gonna turn the tide to make the main thing the main thing? That's number three, choose. What will your family's main thing be? What will your family's main thing be? And find a way to identify this in your home, a physical way. Joshua pointed out this huge rock in front of the people of Israel and said, that rock, every time we see that rock, we're gonna be reminded, today was the day we drew a line in the sand and we said, God is the main thing. It will stand there as a witness. Put something in your home that holds everyone around you or put it on your screen if you're Skyping your family or whatever that reminds you to be accountable that we're gonna make God the topic of our conversation. God is gonna be the main thing. When we talk about sports, we're gonna talk about how we play godly. When we talk about music or education, we're gonna talk about how it prepares us and shapes us the way God makes us. God is going to be the main thing, but put something that reminds you invisibly in front of you, something you can see, something that's tangible where you can hold one another accountable and say, remember when we said this. You will thrive in a whole new way when God is the main thing. God deserves to be the main thing. It's for your benefit. It's for his glory. Our families will thrive when he is the main thing. But you have to choose. It won't happen on accident. In fact, one of the cool things that's happening coming up soon, you guys can come on up. This is our Memorial Day mission trip to Mexico, which is often a family mission trip where people say one of the ways we're gonna live out it being the main thing is we're gonna go to Mexico, we're gonna build a house over a weekend, we're gonna support some people, we're gonna love God, and we're gonna live together in this thing, thing and it's awesome. And so uh, give it up for them because it's weird to walk on stage when it's quiet. These are just some of the folks on one of the trips uh, in our church where uh, people are just saying, God's the main thing, and this is one of the ways we live it out. They've set aside part of their calendar. They've set aside finances. They've done all the things that we talked about to keep God at the center, and they're gonna go live it out for a week and practice for a week what it looks like to live on mission and keep God the main thing. And one of our favorite things here in our church to do is to pray for them as they go, because we know without God, apart from him, we can do nothing. Uh, and so would you stand with me and we're gonna pray for this crew as they head out on our behalf. God, thanks so much for families and people who will say uh, that you're the deal, God. 
And in one of the ways, on one of the weekends of their life, they're going to live it out super intentionally. And so, God, we pray that you'll go with them as they head into another country with completely different culture and different opportunities. God, that you would raise their attention completely to you, that they would be reliant on you and attentive to you, not only for their safety, but for all the things that you're going to call them into, the conversations that they'll have with one another and with others, uh, the trip that begins even from the moment, even that begins now and the conversations that they're having, and all the stops along the way, even for meals the work that they'll do, remembering that, that you've made us whole beings and that we can, we can use our physical bodies to do physical things that represent spiritual truths, God, that the people in Mexico are loved and that they're valuable, that they matter, uh, and that they could, they could live with you as their main thing as well. And so, God, I pray that this trip would transform not only these folks who are going, but would also transform uh, the people who, who they will visit and serve. And so, God, above all, I pray that it would make you famous, that you would be honored, that you would receive glory, uh, and that we might all live fuller lives uh, with you. And so, God, we're counting on you because we need you. We can't do this without you. On behalf of all the other families in the room, God, please strengthen them. Give them the wisdom they need and the complicated things that are their lives to make you the main thing, that they would discipline and make the priority that they would encounter you and talk to you and repeat the things about you, tell the stories of you, discipline and instruct all those things that you've called us to. We love you, God, and we can't wait to see what happens when our families thrive in you and how our city comes alive when they see families thriving in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Have an awesome weekend. We pray with you down front and in the back. See ya. Thanks.